and delivers them out of all of their troubles. The Lord is near to the broken heart and saves the crushed in spirit. I don't know if you're broken hearted or crushed in spirit this morning, but what I do know is that the Lord hears his people when they come to worship him. And I do pray that we will indeed come with worshipful hearts this morning to praise and to glorify our wonderful God together. Well, welcome to worship. It is lovely to see you uh, again. I do pray you had a good time last week with, with Grant. Uh, I listened to Grant last week and I'm, I'm certain that you would have enjoyed and benefited greatly from his preaching of God's word. Well, if you watched the news at all uh, this week, you will know that last Tuesday was a day in which records were broken when the UK experienced its hottest ever day. Yep, a temperature of 40.3 degrees, that's 104 in old money, was registered in Coningsbury in Lincolnshire. It was hot, wasn't it? It was hot. Now, if we recall the news that day, uh, we remember how there were some destructive effects to this heat, wasn't there? Think about all the wildfires and the issues of transport, the, the melting rail lines and what have you. Folks, high temperatures can be dangerous. And let me tell you that there is no more destructive thing to Satan's kingdom than when the temperature of spiritual heat increases in the church of Christ. Yep, when God's people burn brightly for the Lord, the evil one shrinks back and finds himself on the retreat seeking respite. Beloved, let's assure and ensure that as we gather here this morning, we do so burning brightly for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's turn up the heat, as it were, and praise and glorify our great and wonderful God together. So we're going to begin our worship by singing. It's mission praise number 957. We want to see Jesus lifted high. We'll rise to sing.
fun song to start our worship with, isn't it? Well, let's come before this Lord that we desire to see lifted high in prayer, shall we? Let's pray together. Lord God, may your Son be exalted, witnessed, and praised this morning in this your house. May we catch a glimpse of his love. May we see his glory. May we taste his compassion. And may we know his salvation. Lord, it is our plea and our prayer that you would burn brightly with your love inside each and every heart present this morning. Inflame us with a passion for your gospel. Ignite us in service. And fill us with the fire of the Holy Spirit today. Heavenly Father, we each arrive here today with different needs, with varied concerns and with contrasting burdens. And so we look to you to understand all of our difficulty. We look to the one who immersed himself in human frailty, that we may be raised to glory. Yes, we are sinful. Yes, we fail you. Yes, we are not what we ought to be as new creations washed in the blood of the Lamb. And so we bow our heads and confess with our hearts. We confess the many times that we neglect you and hurt each other. We confess the times when we are lackluster in our worship. We confess the occasions where we focus not on you and your glory, but we seek to please our selfish natures and steal your crown for ourselves. Forgive us, we pray. Cast our sins far away, and through the cross of Jesus, we may declare that I am accepted and I am forgiven. So, dear Lord, we pray for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit in this sanctuary today. We pray that he would dwell in and among us, that he would open dim eyes, unstop deaf ears, and soften hard hearts. For those who are suffering, we ask, may we plead for relief. And in the stillness of our hearts, let our prayers rise heavenward. We offer, Lord, our adoration, our supplication, and our worshipful praise in the words that the loving Lord Jesus taught us to say. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, many of you will be aware of this, but I am a huge fan of US college football. I like the university version of the gridiron. Now, the season of... Uh, college football is still a little bit away at present, but each year there are two games circled on the calendar upon which is bestowed a unique title. The Notre Dame v. Boston College game and the Utah v. Brigham Young game. These meetings are given the epitaph, the Holy War. Holy War. Any guess why this might be? Hmm? What? That's the right. You don't need to know anything about sport to get this. A knowledge of history, geography, and demographics should enable you to guess why. And it's because Utah and Brigham Young are both predominantly LDS Mormon schools, and Boston College and Notre Dame are largely Roman Catholic institutions. So when these teams clash on the field of this, this intra-denominational struggle, their matches are known as the Holy Wars. Now folks, this morning we encountered the Hebrews fighting their first as a nation, Holy War. So Israel had been freed from slavery in Egypt Yahweh had kept his covenant promise detailed back in Genesis 15. Remember that? 
He displayed his global superiority by executing judgment over all the gods of Egypt. And by means of these ten plagues and utilizing a stubborn king in Pharaoh, Yahweh had glorified his name in all the earth and he had done so for the good of an often backsliding and faithless group of people. Now two weeks ago, we saw the Hebrews engaging in their established pattern of doubting God whenever the going got tough. A crisis of supply, a lack of food and water caused them to hearken back to the kept days of comfort as an asset of the pagan system in Egypt. Once more they doubted God's word and they whined to Moses and yet we found that God was leading them to a place of dependence and trust in him. He would provide for their needs And the God who provides Jehovah Jireh enabled his chosen to receive sustenance in the desert by way of manna from heaven and water from a rock. Now folks, the message is clear. God does not save his own from the world and then abandon them. No, our God saves the slaves, he redeems the captive, that's for sure, but then he continues to love, to shepherd, and to care for his chosen by providing them with all the good things that they need. And so two weeks as we signed off, we were given a hint of what was to come. You see, the last words that we read detailed the ongoing issue faced by the Jews, and it is that of doubting God's goodness and doubting his presence. Remember how the the, the reading ended two weeks ago? Moses had struck the rock, God had given his people water, and then Moses names the place where all all this occurs, and then verse 7 says this, he calls his place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Is the Lord among us or not? Is God here? Does he care? Will he help in times of trouble? Will he sustain us in our desert wanderings? Is Yahweh a God who's involved or is he a kind of absent parent of doing his own thing? Now folks, perhaps this question that so troubled the Jews in 1400 BC vexes you this morning. Perhaps you arrive here today doubting God's love doubting God's care, feeling that you're on your own and that life is hopeless. Beloved, before we begin our reading, let me point you to a dark hill near Jerusalem. Let me invite you to gaze upon a man carrying a wooden beam up that hill only to be nailed to a cross and lifted up against the soon-to-be-darkened sky. My friends, God loves and cares for you more than you could ever imagine. The Son of God loves you and gave himself for you. You are far from alone. You are treasured. You are loved. You are recipients of the Holy Spirit's indwelling so that you might be under no doubt of this fact today. Yes, my friends, the Lord is among us. And the Hebrews shortly will discover that Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides, is also Jehovah Nisi, the Lord my banner, as he ensures victory for his people in their first encounter with God's enemies in this world as a nation. So let's read the story of the first holy war, shall we? It's Exodus 17, and I'll begin reading in verse 8. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. 
So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and one and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. We'll end our reading there this morning, folks. Thanks be to God for the reading of his word. We're going to sing uh, once more before we look at this uh, holy war. We're going to rise again and sing, As we are gathered, Jesus is here. Some say uh, it was Napoleon, uh, others suggest Frederick the Great, but regardless of its origin, I would wager that you have heard the phrase, an army marches on its stomach. And if a war is to be won, then a full belly and bags of energy are required for the battle. Now today, after having dined on quail and manna and had their thirst quenched by water from the rock, we shall see the Hebrews test this theory. After only about two months of leaving Egypt, Israel is engaged in its first armed conflict. The four headings will help us to examine this holy war. The enemy attacks, verse 8. The battle rages, verse 9. The victory is won, verses 10 to 13 and the memorial is erected in verses 14 to 16. 
So first point, the enemy attacks, verse 8. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. And folks, let's think about the who, the when, and the where here, shall we? First up, who were the Amalekites? Well, the Amalekites were a nomadic tribe related to the Jews who lived in the Negev. Now, Genesis 36 tells us that their origins go back to Eliphaz, which is Esau's oldest boy, and his concubine, Tima. So the Amalekites, meaning the valley dwellers, were distant cousins of the Israelites. They were descendants of Isaac. So that's the who, uh, but they were, but, but what did they do? Well, in the region of Rephidim, which means rests, they launched a sneak attack on the redeemed Hebrews. Deuteronomy 25 details the plan. It says they cut off Israel's tail, which means they attacked from the rear. One of the commentators, Clark, wrote this. He said, in the most treacherous and dastardly manner, they came at the rear of the camp. The baggage was their object of desire, but finding the women, children, and aged and infirm behind with the baggage, they smote them and took away their spoils. So let's think about what's going on here. In the place of rest, following a great victory over the Egyptians, and after having just experienced God's blessings and his provision, the Amalekites, who some suggest represent the pagan world, and are as such agents of Satan, initiate a sneak attack on God's people. After blessing, the battle comes. After the time of great spiritual gain, the enemy often sets his sights on you. So folks, let's apply this. When all seems calm and placid, Satan is prone to come round the back. He searches out our weak spot and begins to commence guerrilla warfare for our souls and on our salvation. Guys, be very, very wary of letting your spiritual guard down following a victory or a blessing. There is no more opportune time for the enemy to attack than in the place of Rephidim, that place of rests. This is what Israel was to discover. Following the enemy attack, we see the battle raging. Verse 9, Moses said to Joshua, Choose for his men and go out and fight with Amalek. Now notice here that unlike the destruction of the Egyptians at the Red Sea, the Lord now instructs his people to play an active part, an active role in this warfare. Now folks, this is the passive and the active in synergy, isn't it? Ligon Duncan says this. There is a passive element of depending upon the Lord, trusting in the Lord, resting in the Lord, watching the Lord work, depend on his power. That's what we saw at the Red Sea. And there's the active element of doing the responsible things God calls us to do. Both elements are part of healthy Christian growth. He says if you have a totally passive approach to Christianity, you'll be in the let go and let God camp. You'll sit in the pew and you'll see what he's going to do. If you're in total active camp, you'll have a hard time trusting in him to do it and you will be trying to figure out the way you're going to do it for yourself, for him. Legan Duncan says this, there is a balance in the Christian life between depending on God and on acting in accordance with those things he has called us to do. You see that balance here as the Hebrews are called to play an active role in their own defense. So the Hebrews are commanded, specifically Joshua, to choose to select men capable of fighting. Now in the past year or so, I've witnessed it firsthand the selection and training process of those who are charged by a nation to engage in warfare. Now, a country like ours has a large pool of folks to choose from, and many of those folks have been dreaming of this job from a young age. But here, as we find the Hebrews, it is doubtful that there were many 
who had their hearts set on such a task. You see, Israel was not a seasoned fighting force. They lived hundreds of years as slaves in Egypt. In fact, when they left Egypt initially, do you recall that God led them in such a way as to avoid the possibility of war? Exodus 13, verse 17, we read that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So Israel wasn't cut out for this. There were no battle-ready Israelis. The odds were in the Amalekites' favor. But here's the thing. From redemption as slaves to settling in the land of promise, there is a battle to be waged. And this battle, this conflict, this struggle against that which would seek to thwart one's progress with God is a battle faced by all who know and follow Jesus. That's why Paul speaks about spiritual armor. The Christian life is a continuing struggle against our worldly sin natures. Yes, we make progress. Yes, we may grow in our sanctification, become more Christ-like. But until we step into Canaan's land, until either we close our eyes in death or the Lord returns, we shall have to fight the enemy of the flesh. Now, I don't know what kind of boot camp Joshua set up for his men. I don't know what kind of training they undertook, if any. But I can tell you that training, that devoting time to prayer, to Bible study, to worship, to meditating on God's word and meditating on the Lord is absolutely an integral part for our spiritual fitness for battle. Folks, let me encourage you. Most of the year we have evening services. All the year we have midweek Bible studies. We have prayer meetings in this place. Make use of these training programs. Grow in your faith. Equip yourself for service. Seek progress and be strengthened while you're on this journey to the promised land. So we've seen the enemy attack and the battle rage. Now in verses 10 to 13, we find the victory is won. While Joshua's forces fought with Amalek, verse 10, Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side, and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Okay, so what is the significance of Moses holding this staff aloft? When it's up, Israel prevails. And when the octogenarian Moses experiences fatigue, and he lowers his staff, the Amalites get the upper hand in battle. Now tons of ink have been spilled trying to reason this one out. Some say that it's representative of prayer. Moses is on the hill praying, and Aaron and her support signifies the joining together of prayer. Here's the thing. Most of the time, Moses is seated. We almost never find any examples of seated prayer in the Old Testament. Others would suggest that the staff being held aloft is to signify a military advance. It's like go. The commander lifts up his hand and he signals the troops forward. I'm not sure if that one carries any weight either because it's Joshua who appears to be in charge of the military operation. Some posit the idea that Moses is putting Amalek under a curse and the staff is a a, a sign of of God doing that curse. Still more claim that the staff had mysterious magical powers which enabled Israel to gain victory. I'm not sure about that one. It's not Harry Potter's wand. It's not Loki's scepter or Gandalf the Great Staff here, is it? 
But here's what I would suggest. The staff, the rod, is a sign of the power and presence of God. I mean, think about it. In previous stories, the staff and the striking of the rock and the parting of the seas indicates God is at work and he is present through his chosen agent, Moses. Now, doesn't this tie in with the last statement that the Hebrews made, is the Lord among us or not? The ebb and flow in battle in accordance with the movements of that which signifies Yahweh's commission and direction of Moses answers the question here with a resounding yes. Commentator writes this. What is clear is the answer to the question, is Yahweh among us or not? Not only is Yahweh there, but he alone assures Israel's life. And that life is mediated through Moses. And the same Moses, may I add, who earlier in the chapter complained to God that these people were about to stone him. So the staff in its role tells God's people that yes, they are engaged in the fight, but the victory is attributable to the Lord's presence and power. As the hymn goes, I'm sure you know it, in fact I hope you know it, in heavenly armor will enter the land, the battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against us shall stand, the battle belongs to the Lord. Do you know the chorus? You know it? We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. So Israel was learning, Israel was learning here that its success, even when it was actively playing a part, is still down to the Lord's working. Now folks, doesn't that pattern run true in our own lives? Even in our own ministries? Yes, we might diligently battle and win spiritual victories over sin, self, and Satan. Yes, we might experience some advance in the church of Christ. But we must never lose sight of the source of this power and of the victory. Folks, any victory we gain is always given to us by the hands of God. His power, His presence is absolutely essential. And so we've noted so far in our holy war, the enemy attacks, the battle raging, and the victory being won. And now we're going to observe the memorial being erected. Look at verse 14. The Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua. I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, the Lord is my banner. Now folks, right here God recognized that his people have a habit of forgetting spiritual victories. And so he instructs Moses to write down in a book what had taken place in this battle against the Amalekites. Folks, it's good isn't it? To have a record of successes. To look back on in times of discouragement. Let me ask you, do you keep a record? Do you erect a memorial, if you like, to acknowledge the good things that God has done and the victories that he's won in your life? You know, I've heard of some people who who keep a daily spiritual diary. Others record only special events. But in some way, God's blessings should be committed to something more dependable than our faulty memories. So when you're feeling discouraged or wondering if God loves you, take out the journal. Refresh your memory. The entries in your journal can be a a continuing source of encouragement. Someone said this, the weakest ink is stronger than the greatest memory. So folks, let's sum up and apply all this. Each of us are engaged in a holy war. And as we progress to the land that Jesus has promised us. Each of us will find that adversaries, external and internal, present themselves as opposition and attack us, seeking to prevent our receiving the blessings God promises to those who trust in His Son. And yet, if we recognize that, yes, we're called to struggle in this victory, 
but the victory is the Lord's and our eyes should be fixed on him, his presence and his power, we will, like Joshua and the Hebrews, put the enemy in our holy spiritual war to the sword. And then, with this encouragement in our lives, and with the memory of it fresh in our minds, we can reflect back and find encouragement for future battles, knowing that the God who defeated the adversary then is right here with us now and always. As the song says, when your enemy presses in hard, do not fear. The battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend. Your redemption is near. The battle belongs to the Lord. Let's pray together. Our good God and our loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we each are aware of our own spiritual battles and challenges. So, Lord, we thank you that you are a God who shows us that you are present and that you are powerful. And that if we would follow you, if we would commit to, to you, if we would undertake to train our spiritual souls to be like you, Lord, then the victory will be given to us by you. So, Lord, we pray for all who are undertaking challenging times right now spiritually. We pray for those whose faith is weak. We pray for those whose commitment is lukewarm, Lord, and we ask that you would once again inflame our hearts, that you would show us that you are a God who is a triumphal God, a God who enables victories in this life and eternal blessings in the next. Lord, hear our prayers this morning, for we ask them in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, we're going to close in singing this morning at 639 in our mission praise books. In heavenly armor, we'll enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. We'll rise to sing.
couple of uh, announcements before we close. Do remember, there's no evening service uh, tonight. There is a midweek Bible study and prayer meeting on Wednesday at 7 o'clock. From 7 till 8, we will gather to pray for the needs of the church and the community and to study God's word together. So do make a place in your diary for the midweek meeting. Let's pray, shall we? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore.